Hello, and welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. This is season four, but like the last few episodes, this is not a case acceptance episode. This is an update episode. Um, It is May 13th when I'm recording this. Um, Me and my partners, Dr. Hunter Smith and Dr. Will Little, closed on a group of three practices surrounding the Indianapolis area May 1st. This is 2019. So originally we were supposed to close on April 1st, but we got delayed because of lending. So this is an interview with my co-host, Dr. George Hariri, at the very end of March. So originally I thought we were going to be closing in April. Didn't happen till May 1st. And um, so this was my very naive perspective on everything in, in March. And I feel like the month of April, even pre- ownership um, taught me a lot and I, I screwed up some things and um, almost didn't make it to the closing table but but we got there um, I also said a lot in that interview to George and I had to go edit some of that out so I, I really respect the the sellers of this group of three practices it's a husband and wife team and one of their wishes was that I not talk about the price of these practices or EBITDA multiples. And um, so this episode with George, we had talked about that. I also did a whole other episode with uh, Alistair McDonald. And I don't, I don't even know if we're going to be able to air that one. I'm going to have to go back and, and listen to it. But um, a lot of that sur- surrounded the decision of should I buy these practices or not. And the price and the EBITDA multiples all played a factor in that. And at the end of the day, the, the Alistair episode his big thing was he likes to buy things on sale and he likes to buy things on the bottom of market cycles. And his opinion is that right now we're, we're closer to the top of a market cycle and things aren't really on sale. So I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, and so his, his advice was to not buy these practices, but we did. But um, this whole weekend at the Dental Success Summit in, in March, at the end of March, was great because I, I sought out as much as possible people who told me that um, maybe this wasn't a great idea and why. And so this episode with George is me getting George's opinion. And um, like I said, it's it's painful for me to go back and listen because I really, I still, I still am. I was and still am naive and have a ton to learn. Um, But my goal is to be honest as much as I possibly can in this whole process. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this. Um, I apologize again for the noise and and the loudy, the loudy, the loud uh, hall that we were in where we were recording. But hopefully you get get a kick out of me telling the journey of these three practices to George in, in this interview. So stick around and we'll talk about it after the episode. One frustrating thing when dealing with labs is waiting on a case and not knowing where stuff is. You or one of your team members has to call in, have the patient's info, you get a hold of the person, they go track it. It, it takes a while, it's, it's inconvenient. Lab Pronto with Blue Sky Bio has introduced a solution that I hope we can get industry-wide for, for dental labs. And what they do is once you've submitted your case, they notify the dentist via email and text throughout the process as the order is being fulfilled. So step one, you place the order. Step two, they receive it. They send it to a network of top tier labs with relevant knowledge and experience. Step three, the lab with immediate available time claims the job, prepares the relevant parts or digital plan. And then step four, the lab completes the order and returns the part or dental service to the dentist. So what do they offer right now? Orthodontic services, including orthodontic plans, model printing and aligner fabrication, surgical guide services, including treatment planning and surgical guide fabrication. In the future, we're looking at things like denture design and fabrication, crown and bridge, radiology report. It's pretty exciting. Lab Pronto is changing the way we interact with our labs. Lab Pronto from Blue Sky Bio. Okay, welcome back to the Shared Practices Podcast. This is another episode here at the Dental Success Institute. If you hear loud thumping 
in the background. That is the live music going on between segments on the other side of the wall from us. And if you hear clanking and people talking in the background, it's we're just hanging out in, in this room. George, this is a very lively event. I gotta say, like I've been to a you know, fair amount. Yeah, this this one's this notch. this and voices of dentistry are just like I'm like a kid in a candy shop. Like it's people I love, like new relationships, new conversations, like. I, yeah. I freaking love this. I had that experience with uh, Drew Sparks out here from Swell. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I've talked about it probably too much now, but yeah, huge, huge fan of Swell. And we sit here right next to them. It was uh, definitely a kid in the candy store moment for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so this episode is another um, Let's Poke Holes in Richard's Dreams episode. Cool. Um, My uh, favorite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, um, I, I need a healthy dose of reality and okay. why... Uh, Maybe seemingly good plan is maybe not so seemingly good, or or maybe there's some some pitfalls. So how about we don't release this episode until you've closed? Yeah, no, I or, can't. Or until things have fallen through, so we can be or a little bit things have fallen. <laughs> like one or the other, you know, like so at least we can uh, talk honestly about. Oh no, that's the like, plan. I can't. And I, I can't can, talk like, about this until none yeah. of this is dropping till after. Okay, hopefully the fifteenth is now. Hopefully yeah. when they close. <laughs> but um, so, um, well, Richard. I've talked enough in our other episodes, so um, you lead the way, and I, yeah, so Richard is buying three offices in Indianapolis, and it's a plan I'm not a huge fan of. Yeah. And, um... I, I want to go back to a specific moment. Okay. Um, so when we found out we were moving to Indianapolis, I was going to be a medical recruiter, and... You are a medical recruiter. I am. I actually freaking love it. It's surprising. Um, a lot of fun. But, uh... I was like, man, I would love to buy a practice. Went to Breakaway, lit a fire under me. I set a goal by the end of 2019. I want to find an acquisition. And if not, I'll do the unforgivable and start the process on a startup. Um, and George just like cringes and moans on the inside. Um, because I, here's the thing. Like I legitimately felt like, what if I can't find something? Like even though I know all of the steps. My answer is you're not looking hard enough. I've, I've ever, I hear that all the time. Right. Like, into, I've never met somebody that has tried hard enough and not found not something. Not found something. Yeah. Like, and, and maybe it took them six to 12 months to find something yeah. that was good because they had a filter on and, and knew when to say no to things. Yeah, you got to know when to say no. Um, but I just, I just want people to know that even though we've done this podcast, we've seen the results, we've seen other people do it, we have the tools, we have the course... I still had that little pit of doubt in my stomach of like, holy crap, am I going to be able to find something that I'm proud of on the podcast? <laughs> um, and, and so when I had that, I was like, okay, I need to talk with George. And we had a great conversation. Um, I remember I was on a treadmill on the second floor of <laughs> Fort Sills, super nice gym that they have. And we, I was walking and talking with George about what kind of practice I wanted and the vision that I had. And we walked away, I, you know, I came in with like, okay, you know, what, what's been the most impactful for you? And I'm thinking I want something bigger and tell me, you told me some really specific things that yeah. were good filters for, cause I was like, okay, how many operatories should I set as a minimum? Like what are some minimums that I, I can have to filter out practices that I don't want? So let's go through your vision first. Yeah. So I guess maybe I'm insane too because I didn't think it was a crazy. And I think that like that's a good place to start. You came to me, I want to buy a practice while I'm in the military doing this medical recruiting job where I have flexibility. Yeah. So and I've got two years. If there's a fire, I can go. And if there's, you know, like whatever, right. I, I can go there and attend to it. And so then like maybe we're two crazy people together where I was like, oh, that's totally cool. Right. I, I almost bought a practice as a second year dental student. So like for me. How close did you get on that? Closer than I should have been. Okay, fair <laughs> that enough. That was going to be a bad situation. Yeah. Really bad. Um, for the reason that I cannot produce as a dental student. Mm -hmm. And so that's where, like, Richard has a unique clinical skill set that is, like, the exact opposite of my clinical skill set where you do a lot of advanced specialty procedures that are most likely referred out. So you kind of have this situation where you can be a pseudo-specialist in your own office, and instead of doing that through multiple locations, you could do that through your military thing being your day job, and then that's kind of your side gig is going to your office and doing advanced specialty procedures. So that's where I felt like it made sense. And, and I, I've, I've known I wanted that. Um, I was super stoked. I didn't even realize that Indiana had EFTAs at first because 
you don't even need a certification to be an EFTA. No way. All assistants are expanded function. Like, oh. there is no EFTA versus regular assistant. Okay, well, that makes me feel better about Arizona. Okay. Yeah, because they got to go to, like, a lot of, like, it's like a long course where they learn to place composites and stuff. I mean, my right. dental school teaches it, so. Well, and, and there is a course that you can send them to. Yeah, but which they don't, you should. They don't have to, and I, but I will. Yeah. And, and you can also train them in office and hold them to a high standard. And I know this stuff. is your episode, but i got to throw in a piece here. Good. Like, I genuinely think it's a consideration. When you are looking to live in a state, yeah. the states where fillings can be placed by an assistant is like... A game changer. Yeah. Unless you just love composite. Which, and, like, who does after, like, a long time? Don't say that. I mean, okay, don't sorry. Don't say that. Sorry. Because there's the, the I, biomimetic movement. There is a yeah, very group of people so who are that's minimalist not, dentistry. That's not a fit for an EFTA-run practice. No. Or, you know, but, like... And, and don't poo-poo that. I'm not poo-pooing it. I mean, it's, it's like a... Is it, I, I'm sorry. That was that was a clinically rude statement. I apologize. I'm, I'm right there with you, but you know, <laughs> I, I also I don't can like understand. It, but there's, I don't there's people out there who like it. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I like people are like, what state should I practice in? If it, if I were to do it over again, now that I have two EFTAs, yeah. I would not... Cross li- off all the states. All states where fillings cannot be placed by... And like Texas is like a big one. Hygienists can't even give anesthesia there. Yeah, Texas like, that's is like, super restricted. That's, yeah... Um, so I would just start with a map and cross out all states where EFTAs are not even close. Yeah. No. And and so I was... So Arizona, it was the beginning of 2018. That they allowed it? Mm-hmm. Oh, and no so way. I bought our we bought our practice in August, and our assistant started her program in September. I that was a recent development. Yeah, very recent. Okay. And so Midwestern was kind of ahead of the curve, and they launched their first program at the beginning of 2018. Oh, cool. She was in their third class. So they have a EFTA Training. program. Yeah, so I, I want that. her to go learn the way I learned. And yeah. same with our instructors. And so cool. we very much think that like, she restores the same way I was taught to restore. And that's like that's so a cool. big benefit for me. That's really cool. Um, so I knew I wanted to do specialty procedures. You and others on other shows, um, including Reese Harper's show, they've had some, and, and Mark Costas' show, they've had some very convincing guests that have talked about the idea of multi-practice being this kind of like glorified dream that really maybe shouldn't be glorified the same way and that one large maximized yeah. practice can be such a, a better profitable stress wise situation um and and so i was on board with this and i was thinking okay i loved your story because you were saying your overhead is paid by your hygiene and your associate. Um, so that at the time that you go in and produce your any procedure you do, you're taking home like 80% of that. Yeah. And, and so you told me that, and that was like a, a big like, aha. That's a light bulb. So it's the break-even point. Like yeah. that whole way of thinking about overhead is a much, I think it's healthier. Like your overhead is a thousands of dollars per month. Yep. Depending on the practice, it's different. But it's not like a percentage. Right. Like everyone makes it out to be. It works out to a percentage. Right. But it's a number. And so if you have a big practice that's profitable with an associate or two and multiple hygienists and an office manager that kind of runs the whole thing on a daily day, 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 then you go and do specialty procedures, you get profit from the practice and pretty much your entire fee. Yep. So for me, that is what I felt was the best situation for you. Yeah. And so one office, max profits, great lifestyle, big enough to run itself, but you're kind of in charge still. You're still checking in on a regular basis. And, and that's this conversation Help me dial that in. I think we talked about having like seven chairs plus is like a great place yeah, to be. Yeah, I think eight to ten was what, what would be really ideal for you. Because yeah. if, if you're more than ten, then the size office you're buying is like kind of already maxed out. Yep. But some people build like a ten op office and like don't really do that much. So you kind of find that sweet spot between something to do between one and 1.5 million yeah. with the facility that can support a $3 million office. Right. And then you're just the one that's going to take it there. So uh, that was another criteria. Okay, we want... Preferably eight to ten ops, um, and then another criteria was was hygienists yeah. and and the patient base. So tell me what you you told so me that day. In in my you know so you want a large patient pool and you want a large inactive patient pool too because you can kind of feed in on that Tap to into grow. That. So like think about it as a practice that has had one hygienist for the past thirty years, most likely has a lot less patients that have been through that office considered that their dentist even though they haven't been there in a while as a patient, as an office that has had two or three hygienists for the last 30 years. So I told him, you're doing specialty procedures, so you need an influx of patients that have your special need. And so you need a practice with two hygienists at least, preferably three. That was what I felt was like a really good number for you because then adding a fourth hygienist or a third 
to one with already two, it's just yep. easier because yep. the percentage you're increasing your capacity is less. Totally. So, and I also love that you, for, for other people looking at practices, that two hygiene mark. Yeah, I'm is a big a, believer in the two hygiene practice. That if you have a practice that only has one hygienist, man, like you're going to be hard convinced that that's going to be the practice for you. Yeah, I even think if you want to be a productive solo doc, if you're going to pay, you know, over 500K for an office, I genuinely feel like you should get one with two hygienists. Yeah. I think the one hygienist office is just small. So, like, I think the best acquisition out there is a solo doc, an office doing 800 to 900 with two hygienists selling between six and 700. Yeah. That is like you switch the dentist in that office and it's going to go over a million overnight. Like, I mean, not overnight, but like, it's pretty close to it. Right. Maybe a month or two. It's reasonable, yeah. Yeah. That, that you're, if you make the right changes and have the like, right And vision. I'm not saying two hygienists, like two part-time hygienists. No. I mean like eight, eight hygiene, hygiene days, days per week. week. Yeah. yeah. So I felt like that conversation for me was a very poignant moment of like, I, I even thought walking out of the gym that day, like that's the value of like a, a phenomenal coaching call that yeah. clarifies your vision, what you want, your criteria. Like taking that vision that you have in your head and putting it on a tangible thing that you can look for yep. and execute. Because, and, and, and the last thing that we needed that you and I talked about was an owner who was willing to stay on, a seller. Yeah, that was one thing on. I wanted. because huge. They could stay, you could do specialty, and then it could be a slow transition, and you could kind of ease your way into an associate. Because even though I could do, you know, 16 hours a week of, of production, I'm dependent on yeah. someone else being there. Mm-hmm. And to not have that turnover while I'm still in the Army would be a big deal. So I felt like the group practice is the perfect model for you. Yeah. Because your overhead is, you know, you should cover your overhead with all of those things. Yeah. You know, seller, maybe an associate, some hygienist. You're good. Yeah. And then you just rake in profit with minimal time. It's like the perfect lifestyle practice. Totally. And then maybe when you quit the military, you just do that still for those amount of hours and you make good money. Like that, that was what I felt was the best thing for you. And that's what I was thinking too. Um, and, and so when I called the brokers, Mm -hmm. that was what I told them. It was very, it was nice that I had that exact, this is what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for anything smaller than this. Um, and, and this is what I want. Do you have anything like this? And (laughs) that first broker that I called, she, she's, looking at things she's like we really don't have anything exactly like that you know and i understood how rare that is to have all of these things where you've got a seller staying on it's big enough you know it has to be off market like i don't ever think you're going to find that with a broker right I mean, who, who who contacts a broker and says hey i want to sell my practice and still practice for two years right like that the, you you got to get the guy who's tired yeah wanting to have a less management but still wants to see patients in practice and see the team and you want to get them in that in between and so i reached out to the brokers at the same time i was also now combing through the indiana state dental licenses in in reverse and looking at the oldest ones and building a spreadsheet that i was going to mail email call and visit. i told you to do the upfront homework of finding out who has how many hygienists on their website on their website don't another, call an office that has one hygienist on their website another great way to pare down that list so you can really focus on increasing the number of communications you do with those offices that are more likely to be your ideal fit right and so i had a great plan of okay i'm going to do you know build this spreadsheet of dentists that meet all these criteria who are of retirement age mm-hmm. that i can reach out to and build these relationships uh, 55 and up for anybody 50, yeah 55 and up and work this list at the same time I'm talking with brokers at the same time, you know, just working all avenues, um, networking with suppliers, networking with specialists in the area, mm-hmm. just having the, that fishing line yeah, go in ground. every pond. Yeah. Um, and so this broker, she says, I don't have that, but I do have this listing that hasn't hit our website yet. Like we've just put it all together. Um, less than five people have seen this. It's a group of three practices. Um, would you be interested in that? And so, of course, I'm like, well, sure, let's take a look. Uh, and it was <laughs> it's one. so tempting not to take a look. How at could you not? Like, uh, so, like, I, I, so on a smaller scale, most people, like, that's not a very relatable story. Like, oh, three practices? Let me look. You know, but, like, three ops. Like, three ops doing this much with this few overhead. Like, that's just something that people look at. And I kind of feel like that's, like, the, the, what's it called, the forbidden fruit. Like, I never believe in buying an office that small because right. you're going to get in there and say, let's move. Right. You know, and it's like, okay, now you just bought two offices um, for the price of one. Right. And so, like, it's it's sometimes forbidden fruit is like, just don't look at it. 
don't look at the numbers. Yeah. Because well, you can get so it doesn't fit your vision. You can fall in love with these smaller practices and justify in your head why like this would be good and why I'm going to increase it and waste a lot of time and energy on something that is going to ceiling out. Yeah, a like lot how sooner. many years do you have to practice with not enough ops? Like that is right. such a big problem. Right. Like I would if I was a buyer looking to buy a single office, like I think that's the most relatable situation. I would just tell somebody, don't show me anything that cannot become five ops easily. Like an extra room, some, like something. Um, I just wouldn't even look at it. Yeah. So she says, we've got these three. You want to take a look? And so I'm like, yeah, send me the data. Sure, let me take a look at three offices. Why yeah. not? Yeah. I want one, but let me take the three. Well, and, and I'm like, okay, this probably isn't going to work, but let, let's take a look. So I get all the data from her, reached out to Matt Ford. Okay. Because I was like... I need I need help looking at these numbers quickly. Uh-huh. I can't remember why I didn't reach out to you immediately. But I probably told you I wouldn't do it. You were you weren't <laughs> excited about it. I was not. No, I, I haven't from the start. I have not liked this idea from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. No. And you were vocal about that. Yeah, no. Isn't that my job? Yeah, you know, as your friend, oh, absolutely partner. You know, yeah. Like, if um, I don't like something, I'll let you know. So and and Matt was excited about this because okay. he's he's yeah because he's he's counting offices. He's yeah he's yeah. starting to scale and and he's at three yeah, and, and wants there's to- an attractivity too if you want to grow getting three at once that are run in the same fashion right there's an attractive like organizational component to that i get that right like, so you don't have to do that so him and i dive into the numbers these these like, are yeah. well-run practices yeah with associates in them who were willing to stay on mm-hmm. um and a seller and a seller who's willing to stay on in the one that's a big uh, that's a big piece yeah and um a regional manager as well yes that's so, running all three of them because the, this is a group of four that one of them got sold separately. Separately, yep. So and it is a four scaling down to three with a regional manager who used to run four. And and she previously was Heartland trained. Yeah. Um, Heartland trained managers are like I heard exceptional. Yeah. I have not encountered one myself, but I've heard about them from other people. And and kind of got burned out there and yeah. wanted to start a family, and so she kind of scaled back from being a Heartland regional manager to running a small little mini DSO in Indianapolis. Yeah. So. Um, and because that was actually my first thought when I looked at all the numbers, I was like, "Where's the regional manager? Like, there's not an office manager in each one of these. Who's running these?" And then that's when I had a conversation with the owner. I, I'm telling Christine about this, and she's like, "You're crazy." And she knows me, and obviously has seen my craziness and starting podcast during residency and yeah, yeah. Every every side hustle that I've had our entire marriage, like this working for Howard Fran, getting my realtor's license in dental school, you know. All the things I've done. Uh-huh. Um, and she's like, what's the big deal? Like, this was the first broker call that you made. And you, you don't buy this group, you'll buy another group. Yeah. And I'm like, no, you don't. Like, Yeah, no, it is rare that a group of practices is for sale. Um, and, and that are this well run, that have this kind of profit margin, that coming as a package. And, and I've been saying for a long time, I'd love to have a group of two to three practices where I can rotate, do the Yeah, that has work. been your long-term vision. That's been what I've been saying. And yeah. I thought it would be a 15, 20-year plan. And I also adjusted that vision back to, you know what, let's just do one large practice. So this is like a step back from what I had kind of thought yeah. was, hey, this would be ideal. So I, I told Christine, I was like, this isn't going to work. Um, but let's pursue it as far as we can get it. You know, I'm not going to get financing. They're not going to accept my offer. Um, Matt really helped me dive into the numbers. We built a business plan of like, okay, where is the the low hanging fruit? I want to make sure we can improve these and that there's not they're not already maxed out. Mm-hmm. Um, because one of them kind of looked like maybe it had been like a fix and flip. Like they had bought this, which they had three years ago, two and a half years ago, and increased everything, and it had gone really well. And I'm like, maybe there's not margin on the table to grow these further. Maybe they're already too well run. That was my biggest fear. So let's just real quick dive into, like, for somebody that it's like, why do we feel growth is a necessity? A single office going for over 100% of collections, that's like, banks don't like that. Yeah. But adding these three to the group of 12. That Hunter and Will have. That Hunter and Will have. So you haven't talked about Hunter and Will. I haven't talked about Hunter and Will. So going back, and and I'm doing a poor job of telling the story. So I I tell Christine, I'm like, okay, it's not going to work. Let's just try. Reach out to bankers. Because that was, the broker was like, okay, great. Get a pre-approval. Yeah, on this. And then I'll let you talk to the seller. (laughs) Part-time, as an army dentist, with no liquidity, over 100% of collections. He's like, yeah, just get a bank that tells you that (laughs) that they'll lend you money, and then I'll let you talk to the sellers. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) <laughs> sure sure let's do it so i call lindever no and they're like okay you are all red flags like 
this is literally every red flag that you could have. At once. You have them all. Yeah. Um, so they're like, no, this just does not fit what we're doing. So real quick, like we're, we're kind of tearing this down. But then I think we both agree with your plan to build it back up. So like there's a, there's a good side to the story too. Like Richard's not just doing something like super stupid like with no plan. No, know? I I want people to understand like people here, oh, he's buying three practices. Glorious. They they think glory like no, actually the margins of risk. A lot of risk because okay, so, I I can't step in and yeah. be the main full-time producer at oh, any of these three offices. offices. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, even so, if you were full-time dentist, you still couldn't. Yeah, someone breaks a leg. Yeah. Um, you know, we get sued crazy weather, someone drives a truck in the front of one of these offices, you know, like the chaos that is just normal life. If that happens, I'm even more unable to step in and fix things. 100%. Um, in addition, with the debt service on that is um, on top of the overhead of these practices. And that cuts into the EBITDA. So it's like, yeah, yeah you've got EBITDA, but your EBITDA after debt service is like, is your cash flow after we're paying DSO fees, after we're paying a regional manager, after we're paying the debt service. That's a lot of revenue to have very little. So now you're at a 10% margin yeah. after debt service. Right. And, and, and you hit a bump. You have some down months. Yeah. Um, you're, losing man, you're losing money. Losing money. Yeah. Um, so, so it's kind of scary. Yeah. It's, it's really scary because rather than if I was buying one practice, the overhead and the margin would be so much different if it was run well. You know, I've, you know, Matt Ford talked about a practice that was producing a ton but had a really high overhead. But if, if you're buying this kind of practice that George is talking about that is producing well. Well, when you, when you do the growth, you control the addition of fixed expenses. You know what I mean? So you don't ha- like you can you can grow into a very profitable large practice. I think it's harder to maybe find one right. that's like already maxed out and profitable. So it's tripled the overhead. Yeah, it's tripled the number of people. Um, Quadruple the risk. A lot of risk. Yeah. Um, and so so what were the things that made us feel good about this? I, if my my thought was if I don't have a plan that I can grow this, the risk is not worth it. If if the only reason the only direction I can go is down from where it is right now, I'm walking away in yeah, a heartbeat. Yeah, so this is a very traditional, like, why do private equity groups overpay for small groups? Because it's a scaffold that you can grow into multiple locations, more than three. I, I feel like it only works if you acquire one or two more offices very quickly. Yeah, and which is exactly what Hunter and, and Will. So I, I haven't gotten to Hunter and Will now. Yeah. So I put together a business plan. I said, okay, hygiene is underperforming. The, the hygiene in these practices can definitely grow based on the production per hygienist, production per day, the ratio of, of doctor to hygiene production. Um, this is something that's not being maximized. Uh-huh. Um, so hygiene was one that I felt we could immediately scale. Digital marketing, like... So there's opportunities to be had. Opportunity to be had. So I put together a business plan of, okay, this is how we would market and grow. Here is how we would grow our hygiene. Here is how we would cut some expenses. While I was recording these ads, I stumbled across a post of someone who's doing a startup right now and wanted to give a shout out to Design Ergonomics on Facebook. So she says, hi all, I'd like to give a shout out to Victoria Paquin from Design Ergonomics. I started working with her for my practice design and she is incredibly helpful, responsive and knowledgeable. If she cannot give you an answer right away, she will research it and call you the next day. You should absolutely call her if you are doing a startup. So just to uh, further dial in this shout out, I've got here Victoria Paquin's phone number. So her direct line is 774-704-5252. Once again, that's 774-704-5252. And we'll have that in the show notes. Her email is vpaquin, V-P-A-Q-U-I-N at desergo.com. When you're designing a practice and trying to build this startup from nothing, you want someone like Victoria in your back pocket who's going to be responsive, happy to help, researching things, looking things up for you, rather than someone that you can't get a hold of and isn't responsive and is dragging their feet. This is the kind of team that you need to successfully launch a startup. Reach out to Victoria or anyone at designergonomics.com and make sure to mention the Shared Practices podcast for your maximum discount. And then the biggest thing, I think, is your ability to go in there and add... Add specialty procedures. Yeah, that's, that's, add that's the big... Like, without that, it doesn't work. Right. So that, that buffer of me adding procedures, me adding availability of time, 
adding hygiene. At no expense. At no expense and growing it. That, that is what, okay, that's my business plan. I put this together in a Google Doc. I send it to Hunter and Will. Because I'm like, okay, these are the guys, if I want some advice on multi-practice, yeah, that, I want their perspective. Who else are you talking to from our little network? Oh, totally. Yeah. And um, so I shoot it over to them, and they're like, hey, it's a good plan. These are good practices. It's aggressive. We like it. And then they're like, hey, we'd partner with you on these. It was like, <laughs> it was like this moment of silence for like 20 minutes. There's like nothing back. And then he's like, we'd partner with you. Like I could tell they were talking and like yeah. had a phone call and had a conversation. And let's, they're like, let's, let's try and get Lowe to partner with us on this. Um, and it, I felt... Matt was also willing to partner on these with me. Um, and I Either was, way, you needed a partner. I needed a partner. you need somebody with the financial security and backing to give a bank the trust that they're going to get you along. And, and Matt had some liquidity. He's got, he's younger in his DSO journey, um, and he's wanting to build the infrastructure and build and scale. Um, that, to be honest, made, made me sound really tired. Um, yeah. Or made me feel really tired. I'm just like... That's the part of the game I don't like either is the... Uh, the building HR back end that you have to put in. Building to, the infrastructure is not what I was excited and about. And finding the right time to do that. If you pick the wrong time, you're in the red. Yeah. But if, you, if you're if too late, then you're holding yourself back. Right. So it's just, I think Hunter and Will have done that. Even Hunter said that probably the best thing they've done is picking the right times to add and grow in certain areas yep. in their infrastructure. So, and, and so at that point, they said, we can get financing. And so... Uh, that gave me the confidence to go back to the broker and say, hey, I've got partners in Arkansas. Can I talk to the seller? Talk with the seller. We have a great conversation, great fit. He's been doing DSO stuff since, like, ortho, orthodontic centers of America, like, back in the day. Um, and he understands, you know, where I'm coming from. He really appreciates that I'm there in Indiana. Really he wants to meet with Christine and I. So we meet uh, husband and wife, seller team. Mm-hmm. Husband is, is a non-dentist running kind of the back end of these three practices wife practices at one of them um and he just they're just kind of done you know they're, they've um had a great career in dentistry and i think they realize that you know maybe this is a good time to sell if they can't sell now maybe they'll sell in a few years so they agree to meet with christine and i we sit down and talk with them and we're realizing like this could be a really good fit um they have an offer on the table from a group in florida uh-huh. and so the pressure's on to like get this valued get this package and put forth an offer and so at the end of the day even with matt i the banks i was talking with were not really playing playing ball and so it was coming down to i was going to need to partner with hunter and will and also i felt like which isn't a bad thing not not a bad thing at all yeah um i was excited to partner with them i would have been excited to partner with matt but i just felt like they were able to support me i need support at this state Rather Both than from a operational perspective and a financial backing. Both, yeah. absolutely. Um, and and Matt wants to grow that and scale that, but he's just not quite there yet. But is going to be there. If 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 it was Matt in two years, I think it would be a lot more exactly what I needed at this moment. Yeah. Hunter and Will had kind of the package deal of that support. And yeah. so we had some partnership conversations and we had some negotiations back and forth. We figured out how we would make this work. Um, now we put an offer on the table and um, they accepted our offer. And this is like all getting very real, very quick. Um, I go out and see the practices. We try and schedule them to come out. One of the biggest X factors is can these associates stay on? Yeah. Um, and we hadn't been able to talk with them. The seller doesn't want us introduce us to the associates until Naturally. we have financing in hand, until we have an accepted offer, until we've negotiated a lot of things. And so this big question mark of are the associates going to stay on, we couldn't answer yet. We had to like make an offer and negotiate and, and move forward. Um, so we do, and, and just timing of things, it's taking a little bit longer, um, and we're still waiting on the bank, we're still waiting on the bank. We have a term sheet from Zion's Bank, which has been – first they said they could finance over 100 percent, and now they're saying no they can't and they need us to bring money to the table so furthering that i want you to further express your sure. concerns with this deal okay so the things i liked about it so um justin this is a justinism of mine yeah. like so the things i liked about the original idea are not in this one. <laughs> it's like, so, hey, I gave you this great blueprint of how you're going to be successful yeah, so like, and live I this ideal life. I was on board life. with the initial plan. Yeah. And then this is a totally different plan. Yep. And so, like, I was on board with 
it works in a single location, I think. I think you're spreading yourself too thin. So the Which is one a chronic thing you, problem of mine. One thing you didn't mention is the location these practices are away from each other. They are. So, so one of them is five minutes from my house. Yes. Super close. And the um, others? That is the one that is, has the most potential for growth. Sure, yeah. Um, and is the biggest kind of growing area. One of them is about an hour from me. Uh-huh. Outside of Indianapolis, about uh, 20 minutes outside of the growing edge of Indianapolis. And so realistically, kind of rural. and then you have two that are about an hour away from you, right? Uh, so that, that one's about an hour. There's another one that's two hours south that's actually closer to Louisville. It's about 45 minutes north of Louisville. So if I, in my head, you have one that's five minutes away, yep. one's an hour away, and yep. one's two hours away. Yep. So like the whole point of this was like you work in the morning, and then you go to the office in the afternoon. Like It's a very lifestyle thing. Sure. So for me, the idea that you can only, you have to alternate. Like you can't go to all these offices in a week. Right. No, you I can't. To, you have to alternate with those two far offices. You've got to go to one one week and then have a miserable time driving four hours to go to the other one. So, and that's my, um, the one that's five minutes away, Brownsburg, that's where I live. Yeah, um, so you're going to be a lot of the time there. That one's going to be the main evening practice. Every other Friday is when I'm going to go down to the one south that's yeah. about two hours and away. And what about the one that's an hour away? I'm going to do that. That one is actually closer to my army work. From my army job, it's 30 minutes. So, so I drive across town in that direction to get to my normal job. Um, so, I mean, like, does our audience see how complicated this? Oh whole yeah, thing? like it's it's awful. It, the whole I, the beauty of it was the simplicity. Yeah, one office, two jobs, army, other office. Like it was just like a and it. So then, then what I don't like about it is, how much money are you going to make in a year if nothing grows? What is your projected income from all of this? About a hundred k. A hundred k. So that's not bad. I'm not, no. not, you know, spitting on 100K. But to take on that kind of financial risk of three times yep. that per year yeah. for, you know, that to me, I didn't love that. No. And then you have a seller working for you. So historically, when a seller works for you, they produce less. You can't afford a dip. Yeah. And you have to mitigate that. And that's like the you were walking into a deal where you can't lose money. And so you have to make that up. And you have a plan with the specialty procedures. But, like, why go through all of this? When you could just buy like just that office right next to your house, just go there two days a week and make way more money with way less stress, like that to me just seems like so much more straightforward. Yep, it is. No, you're absolutely right. So that's where I don't like it. Yeah. Like that's my piece. Where I do like it is getting additional locations, watering down a lot of your fixed expenses on the organizational side and mitigating that risk. So using the scaffold that they've built yep. that you're paying a premium for and using it to acquire other locations at a more reasonable cost and integrating them into your network using the support that you have with Hunter and Will and your office regional manager yeah. that will go around and integrate all those locations. And so that, if that that's is, what you're going to do, I'm like okay with it. Right. But I still feel like you're doing a metaphorical startup in that you're like doing a lot of work that's going to take a long time to pay off when you have a much easier way to more money. Sure. Like that's how I feel about startups and that's how I feel about this. Right. Um, you're right. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. No, and, like, and, it's and, not... and I know that. You know, I, I was looking for a moonlighting gig. This is a really roundabout way t- to find yeah, a good it's a moonlighting very roundabout. gig. It's just all round... <laughs> Everything about this is roundabout. <laughs> you know, like, it's a great way to work really hard for not that much money and, you know, to not even... So, and, and that... And you're limiting your upside by having to partner. Like, that's just I a am. fact. Yep. Oh, yeah. I'm partnering. Um, so, I, and I'm not... But, yeah, I mean, it's slightly more favorable, maybe, but, like, still... You don't own it. So, like, any equity that's split, you know, like, any income from the residual practice is split, any um, growth in the offices yeah. that you are going to sell yeah. is just being shared. So, yeah, I mean, I don't love it for those reasons. Yeah. And I told you all of those things. Like, yeah. I, And I think that's my job. But then also I support you. Like, you know, now you're doing it. So now we're talking about how you're going to make it work. And that's sure. where we talked about, you know, I – was like, I think you need to buy more offices. And he's like, that's exactly what Hunter and Will said this weekend. So yeah. I think we're all on board with that plan. Yeah. And you just got to do it. And, and I think the, the thing that's going to be super important is that, so then we need to be really disciplined about the next two. Yes. Um, yes. The next two need to be great. a great acquisition. Like they need to be not settling for something so-so. It's very similar to what I'm doing in our office where we have extra capacity because we're planning on doubling without growing. Right. Like without adding to fixed costs, you're kind of doing the same thing on an organizational perspective. Like you really have capacity for six. Right. But you have three. 
So you're covering the expenses of six with three. Right. And you just need to flip that and then need to have six. Right. And then all your problems will be solved. Right. I mean, and, not all, but and and, and and grow these as well. So, yeah. So the thing that I like is that I'm being forced to... Yeah, you're being put in a situation where you have to grow or fail. I know that I have to be a non-on-site dentist. Yeah, that's, that, that is a big plus. Because that is the difficulty scaling, mm-hmm. is when you are producing full-time in an office to then add more locations and like be able to manage and grow those. That's and, a very good point. be a leader in those. This is forcing me to not plug myself into any office. To magically fix it. Yeah, and, and then you can replace yourself so easily with a dentist with the same clinical skill set. I mean, not easily, but like I would love much to. easier than a dentist who produces X because of their relationships with their patients. Right. You produce X because of your skill set. So that's like I could find somebody else with the same skills, go to those same offices, produce about the same, and then you can now work on other stuff. Right. So I like that. That, that is a positive. These are positives. Yeah. When I am done with my Army commitment... If I want to not practice full time in any of these and just continue to have a very light twenty hour That's most a week likely schedule, you're do. yeah, I'm I'm set up to do that, and it's forcing me to build that lifestyle proactively with a little bit of chaos and craziness and insanity in the meantime. But it's going to get me to what I've said long term is my vision faster, faster. Yeah, no, that's definitely a big positive. Um, and, and, and forcing me to not do the typical dentist thing of just take over and, and make one of those practices my own. Yeah, and so I feel like, you know, really, you know, I've obviously said not the most positive stuff about what you're doing. But then also it's like, okay, you're doing it anyway. So now it's just prove it to me. And, like, right. you know, like I'll help you as much as I can. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to, like, want you to fail. Right. I just am trying to, war- I'm trying to look out for you. Now that you're doing it, I just got to help you. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm, I'm legitimately, like, I've had a lot of grounding conversations in the last 48 hours. And we've had these over time. And yeah. I, I've known this going in, but I've gotten them on air. I'm getting this on air with you. I'm, I got one on air with Alastair last night at Reese Harper's dinner. They were all talking about the benefit of one large practice versus DSO. Yeah, it's totally changed my, that one group office. I mean, it's like not even, we don't even have that big of an office, but like. It just, it's just, it's so different. It's so much and, better. And to be honest, like, I I think one of the friction points is going to be, and, and, and they're okay with it, um, I don't want to scale infinitely. Like, and I looked around at even this mastermind here with I feel like success six is a good amount. What's that? What do you think, six? I like six. I think that's a good number. Five to six. I don't want to get to the point where I can't be familiar with these offices. Like, yeah, that's something that you've talked about. It's important to you, like going in there, knowing people, and like I, I want to be like in my mind. These, if if I get to five to six practices, this is my group of practices that I'm a consultant at. Like my leadership and buy-in is almost like a, a coaching client that comes in and helps the doc, helps the team, works on the vision, works on the culture, works on the systems. And so these are my consulting clients. These are my practices that I'm growing, and, and I get to influence and lead but I'm not there full time. It'll be fun to watch you become a leader like that, you know, cause you're going to be thrust into a leadership role and you're going to just kind of latch on to things that you've heard or you've known you should do. And you'll just kind of start doing them. And then they just kind of become a part of you. Like, I feel like even in this conversation, I've given you a little bit of advice from my experience that like only I'll have from my experience. Right. And you'll have so much more of that with three teams. Um, it'll be exciting a year from closing to see how much how? different you talk. Oh, yeah. And how much, like, people, the thing with multi-office locations, like, those people that have those, they're so laid back about practice ownership. Like, yeah, I just bought 10, like, no biggie. Like, right. you know, then we went from 50 to 60 to 70, and you're like, um, like, one is, like, kicking my butt. Right. So I feel like that, I love that um, lax kind of mentality that they have with the multi-practice owners. I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, no, and, and like I said, I'm not looking to be one of those multi-practice owners that is scaling like that. But um, yeah, I'm, you got to find that there's like a sweet spot where you don't have to add any more infrastructure. Yeah, and that's that's, that's what I want. Get, is, yeah. is I want to maximize the like two-person infrastructure in Indianapolis. Yeah. At max. You and the regional manager. Me, the regional manager. And maybe if we need to hire like someone that does specific services or you know helps us with certain things, but isn't a full-time employee or yeah. whatever. And office managers in each location. And and that's where Maybe. we don't have that. Maybe. That's she, a big deal. She is the office manager. And I think that's, for her, that is a source of, like, burnout. And, and maybe that's what we'll move to. 
I would think when your locations get big enough, you pick the biggest ones. Yeah. And you put, put them an under office manager management. in those. Yeah, the office manager is such an underrated role in the yeah. office. Like, it's like your owner's assistant. Like, yeah. it's like as important as your dental assistant is to you doing dentistry. Like, yeah. she makes your temps. She does, you know, like all this stuff. Um, I, I think office manager is the ownership side. I, I like what you just said because I think that is how we can scale to that five, six here with just her and I. Oh, is, yeah, you is need with, office manager. With office manager in the bigger offices. You start with the bigger ones, yeah. yeah. One that can support it financially, start there. It'll offload. You guys will learn how to communicate between regional manager, office manager, and owner, and then you guys will go from there. Yeah. No, and uh, I'm, I'm also so excited to just be able to test this stuff out and implement yeah, change. Yeah, that's the funnest thing. Yeah. Like, I got to say, of everything that I've had and experienced, learning something, doing it, watching the result, and seeing that the bank feedback account loop. is like, that is so cool. Yeah. Um, and I, then also your ability to, so like for me, you know, we are pretty low living expenses. We can afford to kind of like have some times where we invest a little bit more. You got to be very diligent about when you grow and how much you take on. Yeah. Because your most profitable moments are right before you expand. Right. And you have to really be careful on adding that office manager, for example, at the perfect time. How much and when. Yeah, yeah that's going to be super important to your success yeah. versus me, you know, like I'm a student pretty much living wise expenses. Well, and so, so are we. I mean, we, we have like used you cars. Have this huge note. We do. That, that, that makes it all real. But here's, the, here, I, it is. Yeah, so like that's, that's different than like your, so but I'm, what? I'm talking about your living expenses as like your operational expenses. Okay. They're, in, they're high, so you can't afford to grow too fast. Because then, oh, and that's where I'm excited to try the, and and this is great. Like you know, in the middle of Mark Costas's DSI pitch yesterday, and like feeling feeling the emotion and yeah. feeling the momentum, and I'm like, maybe maybe I sign up for this. And that's and, where I told you, like the fixed. Hold ex- off. Yeah, the, just be very diligent about your fixed expense. Yeah. No, and and I'm super excited to find the low hanging fruit of like, okay, plug in swell. Bring in yeah, you know, so all, of, all yeah. of the 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 small changes and and be willing to pay for things like hygiene diamonds and Wendy Briggs and and bring in consultants where we can grow the most and we have the most room for improvement. But then also you need to, as an operator of these practices, look at them, get some metrics, please. Yes. Look at them and figure out what are our biggest problems. Yep. What do we do that are the most important things and do those things first. And that's and a lot of them are operational. Yeah. No, so, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And it's going to be, it's going to change on an ongoing basis. Yeah. And it, so just being aware of those things and doing the things that are not adding fixed costs. Right. Like improving your reappointment rate. Like that is like, Huge. I don't know what the reappointment rate is. You know, you'll might know, but like that is something that costs no money that needs to be done. Right. And hygienists need to be called accountable for that. Right. And, and that's, we're, we're focusing on hygiene. We're focusing on reappointment rates. We're focusing on those internal metrics like integrating routing slips like we talked about with routing Kira. slips with Kira like, that's with your huge. front desk like that, that that's the stuff that doesn't cost money just makes you run better and that's that's where you gotta start yeah and then once you start getting more profitable then you can build to be more sustainable with yeah. some added fixed costs is there any other advice you'd have for me transitioning um and and basically as the coming in as the new doc yeah you know coming in with these teams from your experience so you got to normalize the things that go wrong. Like, I think for me, I was so expecting, and I tried so hard to make everything go smoothly for everybody, that it's not. Nothing goes smoothly in life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, th- not, it's what part of the game. So when you have the mentality of like, oh, the chaos is normal yeah. versus the chaos is chaos. Right. Then it's Everything's just broken to, because there's chaos. Yeah, no. it's easier to handle it. Yeah. So I feel like that would be one thing. Like, And embrace the sloppiness. Like your team might not... Okay, so one thing that you've learned is a good practice. Your team is not doing it. Right. In every department, there are 10 to 15 things that they are not doing that you want them to be doing. Don't mention them all. Right. Like, to this day, it drives me nuts when my assistants leave the room with the patient in there. Right. I still have not mentioned it, but I probably should, because I'm mentioning other things. Like, I think you have to pick your balance. Prioritize. Yeah, and, like, these patients are used to the assistants leaving the room when they're there. These are existing patients. Like, that's normal. So, like, pick your battles. Maybe that's one I'll get an email from a dentist talking about how I shouldn't do that. But, like, you just got to embrace the sloppiness of an acquisition. It's profitable but sloppy. Yeah. And I guess people love the startup because you control every aspect of the practice. Right. And it's, like, exactly the way you want from day one. An acquisition is a much more profitable but longer road to get there. Yeah. And so you really need to pick your battles with the team 
and make sure that you are not doing things that are going to be longer roads for you or creating too much change at once. Yeah. You need to very you need to do all the thinking in your head of what is the most important thing for each team member to be doing and give them one thing. Have them do that thing and then move on to the next. But all of the analysis goes on your back end, figuring out what it is for every department that they need to be that doing. That decision one thing. of that one thing per Once they do that thing, you add another thing. Right. That's how I would do it. Cool. But once they've got like reappointment rate, got it down. Case acceptance, we got it down. And now we move to other stuff. But like you got to start with the most impactful things and then go from there. How, and this will be the last question. So one of the things that I really value is the same culture that you kind of have in your practice of, of, fun. of a laid back fun office. And that is going to be harder, harder when you're not there, when I'm not there. Yeah. It's, it's all about um, getting rid of the team members that don't allow for that to happen. Yeah. So in our office, we haven't gotten rid of anybody. Well, one person, but not for that reason. Um, but it was like, it's, it's, Bringing out a funner side of – so our, I, I'm not big on letting go of people and getting new people. Like mm. I try to like really transform the people we have into people we are just better fit. Yeah. So like a couple of staff members we have that maybe initially were not very fun-loving are now fun-loving. You right. know, like you just kind of bring – everybody has fun in them. Yeah. So you either replace team members that are not allowing for that or you – and you make it like very well-known. Like it's important to me that we have fun. Yeah. And like um, you make that part of your culture. And I think laughter is like, you know, we're joking all the time and we set up like a cardboard basketball hoop in our office and our team comes in there and shoots it when, the, you know, when they're coming to get us for stuff. I mean, it's, it's fun. Nice. We still work. Yeah. Like nothing has fallen through the cracks, but we have fun while we do it. Yeah. And you want to be somewhere where it's fun. Totally. And Patients sense that. Team yeah. feels like, it. And it then comes you across. want to include them in the joke. Yeah. Like I think it's hard sometimes to like not hang out with your team in front of patients and include them in the fun. Right. But that's really what we try to do. Like, I'll give you an example. I walk into a hygiene exam and my hygienist know my question is like anything exciting going on lately. And the reason is because they always say no. And then my hygienist goes, not true. They're going to blank. And then <laughs> they'll always rat them out. And I'm like, you're lying to me? You know, come on, that's exciting. You know, yeah. that's like our icebreaker. It makes it quick. Yeah. And it's fun. We joke with the patient and the team. The patients laugh. You know, like that's our thing. And, um, you know, so we, we have fun with patients. Sure. And I think if you can create that culture. You're centering the fun around them. Yeah, we're having fun with them. Right. So our office, like, again, I talked about in our episode, we don't, like, pamper them. We just have fun with them. Yeah. Because we want to have fun, and they're here. Let's have fun. You totally. know, that's kind of our vibe. Have you ever seen that 80s video of, like, the, the dating thing where it's, like, a bunch of guys who are, like, awkward videos of themselves, like, this, this like, dating. Here's what I'm all about. And then there's a whole segment of this 80s video where all the guys go, I like to have fun. I'm really looking for someone who wants to have fun. I feel like we've just done that in our broadcast <laughs> just now. No, but seriously, like your team, there's so much time to have fun in the office that yeah. like, it cannot be all work. And and I really want that. And I want that at all three of these offices. That's hard. It's I don't be know super how hard. To, I don't have experience with that. Totally. Because as an on-site owner, you lean on that crutch of I'm there every day, setting 100%. the example, having all the fun. Um, um, and, yeah. And that'll be, that's why I want to do this whole season on leadership and culture because I'm going to have to build this remotely and I don't know how much I'm going yeah. to be able to effectively change any of that. Yeah, um, and that's it, – it is the – so I talk about hygiene being the head of the snake, but, like, in terms of your team, culture, and vibe, and your relationship with them is the head of the snake. And oh, that yeah. is – got to start there. Yeah. Uh, but I, I – uh, can I just – funny story about Last one, yeah. So yesterday, Richard is here, and I'm texting him. I'm stuck in an extraction. Uh-huh. And our team – it's kind of like an inside joke. Where I don't do extractions, and like, they think I'm like this. You know, this, it's like funny that I don't do extractions, and they're like, they're like cheering me on. Come on, do it, do it, do it. Like when I'm looking at this. the X-ray, I'm like thinking about like, come on, do it, do it. <laughs> so everyone's like, do it, do it, do it. And uh, so then I, I end up doing it because I had a, I just had like one filling that was being done towards the end of the day. So I got to uh-huh. stay while she fills it. It was big. I thought it would take a while. Sure. So I'm like, okay, you know, fine, I'll do it. I'll get him numb, go prep the filling, and then come back and pull the tooth. And um, so I'm pulling the tooth, and we got our whole office kind of like winding down. And they're like, all like, is it out yet? Is it out yet? And they're all like talking Cheering about it behind on. the scenes. Like, I got my three hygienists, like, is it out? You know? And so it was really fun. Yeah. And then, um, you know, like the hyg- I always like to, when a patient's in treatment, I like to have their hygienist come in whenever to get them numb or to come look at it. Or like, you know, if they're available, I like to bring them in. So that guy's hygienist came in and it's like looking at the extraction site like, oh cool you know watch me place a bone graft and like she never gets to see it because i don't do it so yeah. um like for her that was fun and so it just made it a fun thing and i think that That's culture cool. just doesn't cost anything but it, it makes it easier when you try to do something yeah. so when you say hey we're gonna do this you have that no like and trust bank that you can withdraw from 
because you deposit in all the time. Well, and their every day isn't this kind of like underlying kind of like stress, being on your best behavior. It's yeah, like they say that they're so much more relaxed. They're That's comfortable like, all day. Yeah. So then when you say, "Hey, we're going to do this thing," they're like, "Okay, let's do this thing." Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to worry about losing my job for not doing this thing. You right. Know? Versus like, "Oh no, they here's some new thing I'm going to implement." Know that you're going to have patience with them. Let them know that. Yeah. You're not expecting them to be different overnight. There was a uh, with Paul on another episode. Paul Etchison from the Dental Heroes podcast. He he said. Um, grace over guilt so he wants his team members to fail fail fast come in tell them what what he's done wrong and just like okay own up to it and that's okay we're gonna learn from it we're gonna move forward yeah i I just i so much more believe in the positive reinforcement yeah versus awarding positive behavior and only talking about negative behavior when it's like uh, something that you will not tolerate right but if it's like in that medium like they didn't do it as well as they could have like i try not to mention it yeah i try to just talk about all the times that they're positive and then they kind of just naturally will shift behavior. gravitate towards yeah them. um george i appreciate you giving me healthy skepticism and pushing back well it's it's skepticism from a perspective of it's not the best thing right but it doesn't mean you can't make it work right like so now well, let's just focus on making it work yeah you know that that's all we got to do no totally and and I tell people if 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 it doesn't work, it'll be a slow motion train wreck, and we'll document it on the podcast, and uh, you'll all benefit from my pain. Yeah, I think <laughs> I I wish more people in positions of influence, if you want to call this influence, are honest. Yeah, and I think one of the things I want us to really hold our hat on is being honest. Yeah, and so I try to be honest in my episode as best I see it, and I feel like you were very honest more than I was in your episode, so I appreciate that. No, and uh, well, the the oversharing will continue. Yeah, we're not going to change who we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. George, once again, ton of fun. Thanks for uh, meeting up with me here at Voices of Dentistry. And uh, it's, we need to hang out more. Yeah, we do. We do. We will. Cool. This isn't Voices of Dentistry. Dental Success Summit, but sure. Oh, dang it. Ah, oh, freak. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to you next time. We'll see you guys next time. next time on the Shared Practices Podcast. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed... Um, as much as we could, our honesty and and me sharing this journey. Um, and, and like we said in the, the episode, I want to share contrary opinions because on Dr. Costas's podcast, on our podcast, on other podcasts, the idea of multi-practice ownership has gotten a little bit glorified and people think like, oh yeah, you know, someone just owning multiple practices um, is going to be rolling in the dough. And I, and I love that this is back to back with Dr. Matt Garino's episode, um, from the week before, because he's crushing it. I mean, compared to his decision-making, my decision-making kind of looks like, what am I doing? Um, and, and he is, is much more profitable, much sooner as a single doc in a single office and, and is, is doing fantastic. In fact, I just got a picture from, the the Zillow listing of the home, the beautiful home they're about to buy him and his fiance. So um, this is not a path to be repeated or replicated. I'm excited to learn as much as I can along the journey. And I am so incredibly grateful for, like I said, good partners, good sellers, good people at these offices, amazing teams, amazing doctors. Um, I've already been humbled by things I've done wrong and eventually, hopefully, I'll be able to talk about some of those things. Um, but in the meantime, like, I have so much more respect for Dr. Mark Costes and for others who are operating large organizations like this because um, I, I fully had the intention of like, man, I'm going to talk about everything on the podcast. And when you're running businesses, especially with people that potentially are listening to the podcast, like, it changes what you can talk about. And if you say the wrong thing on the podcast, it can color someone's perspective on on the business that you're currently operating and, and the relationship that you have. Um, so I'm trying to be as careful as I can, but as transparent as I can at the ho- at the same time. So hopefully you guys understand, and hopefully this um, is still beneficial. So um, next week I, I plan to do an update episode. So between the time of this recording at the end of March. The whole month of April, and then the first few weeks of ownership now into into May. So um, we'll we'll update you on my journey, and and uh, thank you for sticking around and coming along the journey with me. And we will talk with you guys next week on the Shared Practices podcast.